Let me invite you this morning to find your sermon notes. You received those as you entered. And let's take a look, first of all, at what the ultimate question in life might be. People often say that wisdom is measured so, not so much in the questions that you're able to answer, but in the questions that you ask. And so as a pastor or as a theologian, you might say, well, pastor probably thinks that the most important question, the ultimate question is, does God really exist? And I would say, nee. nope, that's not it. If I took a poll, not only of our church community, but of our entire community today, about 95% of the people would say that there is a God. Now, they would differ on who that God is or what he is, but most people believe there is some kind of a higher power. So let me just ask you, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Anybody? When you stand there on the rim, do you say, oh, there's no God, couldn't be, could never have made that? Or the Pacific Ocean, anybody been to the Pacific Ocean? Standing there on, on the beach saying, oh, no God, anybody fly over the Pacific Ocean? The thing is huge, isn't it? Just to get to a little bitty blip of an island in Hawaii it takes hours on an airplane. What about lying on your back in the summertime, maybe, maybe this week if there's a, a clear night and just looking at the skies and saying, ah, couldn't be a God, look at all those stars. Or when you held these guys the very first time, counting the fingers and the toes to make sure it's all there. Couldn't be any God to create that. Paul writes to the Romans there, it's in your notes, he says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power in divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. So turn to the person next to you and say, you have no excuse. Go ahead and do that. You have no excuse. You know, not only the world, but our conscience. Our heart tells us there is a God. You've got to be blind not to see it. You've not got to be listening if you don't hear that there is a God, if you do not know. And so the ultimate question this morning is not, does God really exist? Of course He does. The ultimate question is, why do I exist? And I don't mean just Pastor Teeman, although sometimes you may wonder. Why do you exist? Why are you here? What is your purpose? What is the meaning of life? And philosophers have been trying to answer that question for thousands of years, and I would submit that most of them get it wrong. The ultimate question, trying to find the answer to that question, someone has said, is a lot like trying to kiss someone through a messenger. You lose a little bit in the translation, don't you? So instead of going to philosophers, instead of going to observers of the world, why not go to the creator of the world? Why not go to the source? Why not go to the one who is the truth. And so Jesus says this. He and his disciples were in the upper room. It's Passover time. Jesus is about to be betrayed and then crucified, and he is praying for all of his disciples. And not just the current ones back 2,000 years ago, but all disciples for all time, including you and me. And he says this. This is eternal life, that you, you, that they know you, God, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So it is very simple. The answer to the ultimate question, why do I exist, is simply to have a relationship with God. That's it. It's to have a relationship with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now this could be and should be the end of our sermon but here's a problem. Jesus recognized that 
most people would not accept the answer all that easily. And so he prays for two things. He prays for us. First of all, for our protection from the world. It's Memorial Day weekend. We will pray for protection from the world, for physical safety. And wouldn't it be great if we never had to worry about our physical safety? Never get sick, never be ill, never have to worry about accidents, injury, any kind of physical calamity. That would be wonderful, but that's not what Jesus is praying for in the prayer. It's not for our physical protection, but rather for our spiritual protection. Because you see, the world can steal life from us very easily. Let me give you a little example. There's a book uh, by Patsy Claremont. It's, it's called uh, God Uses Cracked Pots. Does anybody know what a cracked pot is referring to in the book? It's, it's you. It's us, right? You all are cracked pots. And, and so am I. God uses earthen vessels. He uses less than perfect people to do his work. So in the book, uh, Patsy Claremont, she talks about her little six-year-old son. His name is Jason. Now, Jason is just going to school. It's the fall of the year. He's been riding the bus for the last couple of weeks. And here it is, the third week. Jason gets on the bus. Patsy goes back. She closes the door. She goes about her, her morning routine. When all of a sudden, there is a knock on the door. And she opens the door, and lo and behold, it's little Jason. Now, six-year-olds really only have two goals in life. It is to have fun and to rest. That's still my goal in life. And she said, what, do? what, what are you doing? And very bravely, he says, I am quitting school. Yeah, after three weeks, he's quitting school. Well, she wants to dispense some uh, motherly wisdom, and so all she can think of is a stitch in time saves nine. That doesn't really work. Starve a cold, feed a fever. Nah, probably not. And so she asks again, what are you doing? Why are you quitting school? And he says, I'm quitting school because it is too long, it is too hard, and it is too boring. Well, she has an answer this time. She says, you have just described life, now get back on the bus. And isn't that it? Life is too long. <laughs> it's too hard. And oftentimes, there's not nearly as much adventure and joy as we would like. And so, when, when life begins to overwhelm us, and we've all been there, when you have little ones, you've been there. When you have two little ones, you've really been there. I can say that I'm a twin, so I can say that. And my mother not only had identical twins, but she had four of us in the span of three years. All boys. She was overwhelmed from time to time. You have been there. If your job isn't working or if you lost your job, you've been there. If you have relationships that are frayed or tearing or broken, you've been there. And so when life begins to overwhelm us, we can often lose our Christian hope and joy. Life's too long, it's too hard, it's too boring. And then we begin to look for meaning in other things besides God. God intends for us to find our meaning in Him, but when life overwhelms us, we look in other places. And so people begin to look to the bottle. People begin to look to drugs. People begin to look at relationships that are harmful and destructive for them. They look for a woman that can bring the adventure or a man who can bring the security beyond their husband. Or we desire material things that we think will bring us joy. And we lie and we cheat and we steal and we cut corners to get them. Anybody read the Northwest Herald this last week? What was the headline about two days ago? Largest marijuana bus in McHenry County ever, right? Three and a half million dollars worth of marijuana found in a home in Bull Valley. And if you look closely, there was another article on page two, I think it was, 
of a heroin bust. That's what people are turning to these days. Just in the last two weeks, I know of two 20-something-year-olds who lost their life to heroin overdose. Because they thought that is where joy and meaning comes from. And that's why Jesus prays, Holy Father, protect them. Protect these people. Protect my children from the world. Protect them so that they might be one even as we are already one. There in your notes is a little bit of insight on life. Because I can't count real high, I'm dividing it into two things. Life can be divided into, number one, the means by which we live. And number two, the ends for which we live. The means and the ends. And Paul writes this, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is what? Destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Every individual, every culture can be measured by the means by which they live and the ends for which they live. And for most people, our end is earthly things. And the means is whatever we desire at the moment. So some of you are thinking about the donuts at the end of the service right now. Some of you are thinking about where are we going for lunch today? This last weekend we had graduation here in District 155. A ritual that goes on thousands of times all across the country, May and June. What are our high school students, what are our graduates thinking about on graduation day? Though we have these lofty speeches about the future and, and vision and, and preparing for the days ahead, they're thinking about the summer. They're just like you are. You're thinking about the summer. You're thinking about the barbecue this afternoon or tomorrow and the parade and all those earthly things. And yet Paul says when that is our sole focus on the things that God has created, rather than the Creator Himself, the end is always destruction. God gives us all these things. He gives us these great things to look forward to, certainly for us to enjoy, but even more so, so that we can get to know Him and enjoy Him better. So a question. 5,000 high school graduates were asked, what do you want most out of life? What do you want most out of life? And they distilled all the answers into one sentence. And this is it. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> have enough money. Be secure. Be happy. Have a little fun. That's it for most people. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> have enough money. Be secure. Be happy. Have a little fun. For most of us, we simply look toward progress and technology and science to bring an improved means to an unimproved end. How many of you have automatic dishwashers? Most of us. How many of you have automatic Clothes washers, most of us. How many of you have microwaves? Most of us. Throughout the centuries, science and technology have given us progress. And so, instead of eating around the dinner table, which was the ritual a generation or two ago, we instead hop in the car and send somebody to McDonald's and we bring back a bag of burgers and fries. Or we run through Taco Bell. Or instead of bonding together as a family, doing work together, 
like washing those clothes by hand or gathering around the sink and talking about the activities of the day as we wash the dishes. We simply throw the dishes in the machine and we throw the clothes in the machine and we go on our way. Instead of writing letters and gathering our thoughts, our most intimate and precious thoughts to to tell someone who means a great deal to us exactly how much we love them, we simply sit right next to them in a room and text a little emoji icon, right? At the beginning of the industrial age, when the first transatlantic cable was laid, Henry David Thoreau, a philosopher, he said, I wonder what the very first important message is going to be from Europe that is going to transcend and transform our lives here in America. And then he wistfully said, I I think it's probably going to be whether Princess Adelaide of Europe has whooping cough. I had a lady in my office not too long ago. She had most everything that most of us would like. She had a beautiful home, two expensive cars in the garage, lots of expensive toys and gadgets at her house. She had a great wardrobe, a tremendous career. And yet she told me that she was unhappy. Her words were something like this. She said, I have everything to live for. Why am I so unhappy? Well, she made the tragic mistake. You see, she did not have a relationship with God. And she had a very poor one with her husband and her children. Her mistake was that she... She thought she had everything to live for, but all she really had was a lot of junk to live with. And so Jesus not only prays first and foremost to protect us from the trap of the world and from the evil one so that our focus is away from Him and toward the things that only eventually lead to our destruction. He prays for this protection and then He prays that we might be able to know God. Not just as some nebulous being, but as our Savior and Lord. And that's why He sent His Son Jesus 2,000 years ago. Jesus became one of us, flesh and blood. He knows everything that we've been through. He knows your cares. He knows your hurts. He knows your sorrows. He knows your pain. He knows what it's like when you feel empty inside. And that's why He took all of that and He went to the cross and He died for our sins to give us hope and meaning and joy. And now He tells us that if you want to find that meaning in life, if you want to know why you really exist, it's not for the things of this world, but it's for the relationship with God that will last forever. God wants you to know Him. Not like you know your ABCs. Not just as a character in a book. But He wants you to know Him intimately and personally. Gentlemen, let me talk to you for just a minute. God has said throughout Scripture that the most important, the most intimate, the most most personal human relationship is between a husband and a wife. And Genesis says that the father or the, the man will leave his father and his mother and he will be united to his wife and the two will become one. And not just physically, but spiritually and mentally and emotionally. It's the same prayer that God had for his disciples. He said, even as the father and I are one, I want you to be one with me. My friends, that happens as we come together to God's house to hear God's Word, to ingest God's body and blood in, with, and under the bread and wine in just a few moments. That's what it means 
to know God. And that is my prayer for all of you this summer as we embark on this journey of family, human families as a part of God's family. Knowing the Heavenly Father through our brother, through His Son, Jesus Christ, personally and intimately. Let's close with this. This is the Word of God to the people of Israel. But now instead of saying, Hero Israel, let's say, Hero Emmanuel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments you're given once again today that they might be on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. You've already heard this morning that uh, there's no organized Sunday school this summer. No organized Bible study. So all of us as God's family can be together for at least an hour. And we'll have a message specifically for the children and materials to take home so you can talk about them. When you get up in the morning, when you walk along the road or maybe driving your car these days, And when you go to bed at night, when you gather around the dinner table, talk about the meaning of life. It is God's desire for you and your family to love and to serve Him forever. Let's begin to personally and intimately know our God through His Son, Jesus Christ, this summer, at least for an hour, as we gather as His family on Sunday morning.